my goal tonight is to talk to you about these northern estuaries and particularly how they're connected to Everglades and why that's important. You know, why, how does the water flow through Florida and, and what happened, uh, you know, to change those courses of the water and what are our current conditions. If you look at this kind of graphic, you see on the, on the right hand side, this is a historic flow. And it started up at the upper chain of lakes, which is just south of Orlando. There are about eight lakes that used to flow uh, overland, actually, overflow into Lake Kissimmee. And then Lake Kissimmee flowed into this meandering, winding Oxbow River, about 105 miles long and about two mile wide floodplain. Then the water took about six to eight months to get from that upper chain of lakes down to Lake Okeechobee. And then the big lake in the middle, Lake Okeechobee, used to flow south, as you can see, in about a 60-mile wide flow pattern there known as the River of Grass. And that's aptly described by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas back in 1948 in her book, uh, The Everglades, River of Grass. And that water would take about 16 months to get down to the southern tip of Florida. So overall, that course of water took about two years to get from top to bottom. And I want you to kind of keep that in mind as we go through. This might have been what the Everglades looked like back then. We saw uh, a lot of uh, changes uh, to the, the landscape, obviously, but south of the lake, there was a swamp forest uh, that came down. And then the um, sawgrass plains south of the lake, there were custard apple around the bottom of the rim of the lake. And there were about eight major flows out of Lake Okeechobee these kind of rivers that came into that sawgrass plain. And then the remnant ridge and slough system that you can see at the lower end on the right-hand side is what, uh, what really effectively is still some of that is remnant. But what happened? What happened basically in the uh, turn of the century was that we wanted to drain the swamp. We wanted to get rid of the water. Back then, we were trying to encourage people to move to Florida, and it's hard to have them move here and live in a swampy, mosquito-infested, alligator-infested area. So we literally paid people to come down like Hamilton Diston from Pennsylvania and others to come here and drain the swamp. And what we ended up with was the Everglades now. And the Everglades now is all compartmentalized and channelized to where we have this uh, urban area on the lower east coast that's very developed, an agricultural area south of the lake that we'll talk about and, and, and channelize that water flow. And we've basically expanded our population right up to the very edge and limits of the Everglades and demanded the flood control, the water supply, and encroached right on the edge of the system. And then along in the 1920s, 26 and 28, we had two major hurricanes that came across the state. No warning, no radar, no satellite imagery at the time. About 2,500 people lost their lives. And there's a mass grave site if you go out 76 uh, towards uh, Lake Okeechobee and past Indian Town just before Port Mayaka. Um, and that's when the Herbert Hoover Dyke was authorized. 1930, it took seven years. We built the dike, about 35 to 40 foot high dike all around the, the perimeter of the lake. It's about 143 mile perimeter. Uh, it, and it helped to earthen dike to help kind of control that flow and obviously stop that river of grass south of the lake as, a, as the lake would flow south. So we also, at the, in our wisdom in 1960s and early 70s, was we channelized that Kissimmee River. Remember that meandering Oxbow River back and forth? We dug this C-38 channel right up the middle of this Oxbow River and obviously drained the floodplain and the and the area. So now instead of six to eight months, it takes about two to three days or less to get that water if it rains up in that north chain of lakes to get down to Lake Okeechobee. And this is what we end up with today is this system that's engineered and designed to control Lake Okeechobee so it would never flood. And the Army Corps of Engineers develops a regulation schedule for the level of the lake. So as the lake tries to achieve a higher level, uh, due to rainfall, it will dump the major discharges east and west to the St. Lucie Estuary and Indian River on this side and the Caloosahatchee River on the west side. And those big arrows are indicative of that. And you can see about 1.7 billion gallons a day of that fresh water that used to flow down through Florida is now going to the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. And that equates, if you put that in perspective, all the people, all of us in the white area in the region there, um, in South Florida, about 7.7 .7 million of us, we consume about 1.3 billion gallons a day. 
So literally, we're we're discharging or putting out to the Atlantic and Gulf more fresh water than we actually consume. And there's a cost to factor that, maybe about six million dollars a day. So what does that do to these big systems? And we engineered it to discharge it, and the Corps of Engineers wants to regulate that schedule for around hurricane season. So the beginning of hurricane season in June 1st, the schedule wants to get that lake to the low level as possible, anticipating the, the rainy season in June and July and August and September, peaking out, of course, with uh, tropical storm season. So they want to get that lake down low, and they try to keep it down, you know, less than 15 feet in elevation, and down to usually 12 feet if they can. So discharging to these coastal estuaries, particularly, I won't focus more on the Caloosahatchee, but you have to know that on the west coast, in Pine Island Sound, around Sanibel, Captivia, and all of those areas, getting the same kind of influences that we are here on the east coast. They get this toxic algae bloom that comes down right to the Franklin Lock structure uh, here that you see in the picture and also uh, can even shut down their Fort Myers uh, uh, drinking water plant uh, back in 05. So they get these same kind of influences we do. But I want to talk in detail a little bit about what it is on our coast. The red arrows there indicate the St. Lucie Canal or the C-44 Canal. It was constructed in 1916 to about 1928 and then improved after the dike was built, uh, basically in the 1930s, to capacity so that it would handle these major discharges. And you can see where it goes into the, enters into the South Fork of the St. Lucie Estuary. And then there are two other canals. You can see C-24, C-23 canal. These are agricultural canals that were built back in the 50s in order to drain that general area in South St. Lucie, North Martin County for primarily citrus groves. There's another canal, if you go up north of the C-24, that connects to actually C-25. And that canal comes up closer to here, up at Taylor Creek, uh, right out into the Indian River Lagoon. And that canal is, very, is tied into the C-23-24 system as well. The North Fork of the St. Lucie goes north, almost to White City and Fort Pierce here, about 23 miles. And then it meanders in winding South Fork, uh, about 10 and a half miles, and they come together right there at Stewart. And you can see they head east in a large, wider portion of the estuary, and then south around Sewell's Point, and then connect to the St. Lucie Inlet, and of course the Indian River Lagoon. So this is what the, the structure looks like right there at St. Lucie Locks and Dam, which is, you can see the locks on the, on the top of the picture with the boats coming from the, the left-hand side, coming from the river at sea level, basically, being locked up or lifted up through the lock system to the level of the canal and the lake, usually 14 or 15 feet. But the gates you see there, the seven gates, are actually discharging water to the estuary from the right-hand side to the left, out of the canal, out of the lake, and into the St. Lucie estuary. So what does that do to these ecosystems? It primarily affects a lot of different habitats, the, the seagrass, the oyster reefs, mangroves, and even the coral reefs offshore. And these are some of the uh, seagrass beds that you can see inside the St. Lucie Inlet. A very shallow area is about 700 acres. Uh, we have about five common species of seagrass uh, in this area. But you can see on the left-hand side during the discharges, the light level is cut almost completely by the turbidity in the water, all the suspended silt and sediment that comes in the water. And it cuts that light level and also adds fresh water. And if it gets below certain parts per thousand, then the uh, seagrass won't survive. The other habitats in the nearshore reef system, uh, you can see in the top right, you can see the picture of the clear St. Lucie Inlet State Preserve Reef to the south of the inlet and how the plume goes out offshore about six or eight miles offshore. It also deposits a lot of this silt and sediment in the estuary, in that wide middle section particularly if you threw your anchor over like I did here, you come up with this handfuls of black oozy muck material, almost the consistency of black mayonnaise. And it's very anaerobic without oxygen. It's all down there on the bottom, very thick, over about 8 million cubic yards, probably a lot more than that that's in the system right now. And it doesn't leave. It usually gets deposited there and gets resuspended during high tides and wind conditions in the estuary. Over the years, we've had several different peak events of these discharges from the lake, and we started to notice fish with lesions or abnormalities. 
And those disease outbreaks are correlated pretty directly with about nine different events from the 1980s. Um, about 33 different species of fish, 6% of the population has been affected. One fish particularly, the spotted sea trout, spends its entire life cycle uh, in the estuary. It develops an entire life cycle there. A lot of fish spawn offshore and their juvenile stages are inshore in the estuaries. But this spotted sea trout, obviously, during that time when those fertilized eggs are in the water column and you have this huge discharge event of fresh water, can literally wipe out an entire generation of uh, spotted sea trout. Here's the estuary up close, and you can look at and see some of the areas that we've tried to do in restoring some of the oyster beds. And the oyster reefs are in the blue areas and the yellow uh, in conjunction with Martin County and others. But how does it affect oyster reefs in that middle estuary where the throat of the inlet, uh, the uh, two forks come together at Stewart, the US-1 bridge or Roosevelt Bridge, this is the salinity graph. And salinity is normally at about 20 to 25 parts per thousand you see on the left side. And then you can see what happened this June, June 6th, when it dropped out almost completely below this critical line of five parts per thousand. Now that scale is very simple. You just think of the ocean water being a pretty constant 35 parts per thousand and fresh water being zero parts per thousand. So the salinity in the middle estuary is right where oysters like it. But obviously if it gets too low for too long, and particularly in this event case over 130 days, they can only tolerate about 14 to 28 days for adult oysters. So we pretty much lost about 100% of our oyster beds have been, have been lost uh, during this time. These are some aerial shots also of the aquatic preserves and areas right near the St. Lucie Inlet. You can see the contrast to that plume. And I wanna thank uh, Jackie Thurlow Lippis. She's here in the audience today and her husband, Ed, who are up in this airplane and have regularly taken these aerial pictures over this time, this particular event. It also goes south of the inlet and it affects the St. Lucie Inlet State Preserve Reef, which is the northern limit for hard and soft corals find the Keys and the Palmas. Scientists here at the Harbor Branch have done a lot of studies on the reefs there as well, and also the Hope Sound National Wildlife Refuge. Inside the inlet, uh, again, 700 acres of seagrass beds, a lot of them under state aquatic preserve protection for the Indian River Lagoon and the North Aquatic Preserve. So these aquatic preserves are under state protection, and it's obviously we're at these meetings saying, where are the state and the federal protections for our 36 threatened and endangered species that are in this area as well. Seagrasses get affected similarly to oysters. They like salinity as well as lights that penetrate the bottom. And you can see that for over 95 days, it was down at that critical level, uh, below nine parts per thousand and down to five parts per thousand for too long for seagrass. And we estimate about probably probably 60 uh, to probably 80 percent of our seagrass beds have disappeared. This is a, a, a good graphic on one of the sites that the district uh, samples at Willoughby Creek. You can see around the inlet and just look at the red line. Uh, this was last year when that big dip happened when we had tropical storm Isaac come through and there was a lot of similar discharge event but not the longer duration and you can see it went from about 95 percent coverage down to about two percent it started to recover, and then that red line goes, drops right down to almost zero at, in the September sampling. So again, that, that seagrass, in this case, Johnson seagrass, or a threatened species of seagrass, started to recover, but we hit it again with this next event. And that's what's commonly done in these estuaries, so they get hit over and over again, and they try to bounce back. Similar with other species of seagrass, that uh, manatee and, and shoalgrass and others. We monitor water quality since uh, 1998 and with Citizens Water Monitoring System, and it's just basically a real quick uh, look at the system with some very basic parameters like dissolved oxygen, temperature, and pH. Been doing that for many years. It gives you a quick look weekly. And then also in our system, we've had these uh, health warnings posted up, which are not very nice for the Chamber of Commerce trying to bring people to visit here. Um, or our local boaters and fishermen. We can't allow people in the water or in contact with the water during these algae blooms and particularly the high levels of bacteria. So since 2004, we've had six of these uh, microcystis serogonosa and other microcystin blooms which create a microcystin toxin, which is a heptatoxin which will affect your liver. 
So there haven't been any deaths reported, but we're, we're very cautious, and the health department's cautious about posting these warning signs up to uh, when we have these events. And this is what it looks like along the shoreline, a kind of a green, bright, bright green color that morphs into a almost radiator fluid blue-green color, and that's what we end up with. But they do come from Lake Okeechobee, and they only survive in fresh water. They don't survive when they get out into the saltwater environment. The high bacterial levels, which are typical of freshwater flows during our summer months anyway, got super elevated, of course, during these uh, discharge events. So what's at stake here? What is really the, the issue at stake? And we're one of the most biodiverse ecosystems in North America, right here in the Indian River Lagoon. We have over 4,300 different species of, of plants and animals in the system. And we're right at that confluence and conjunction of both the temperate climates to the north, Georgia, Carolina, converging with the tropics and subtropics to the south. So we get this huge diversity. And the Gulf Stream brings a lot of that together right here at our coastline. And it's even been uh, equated to a value, an economic value. In some studies not too long ago, it's about $3.7 billion a year. And in Martin St. Lucie County alone, there's about $840 million a year attributed to the uh, water benefits and water-related benefits, including about 26,000 jobs. So there are some really direct benefits, and, and the economies are affected, not only the ecology or the environments affected by the system. So now what? So now that we know that this, this flood protection system, this flood system, this getting rid of the water, and we've drained the swamp, we've killed the rivers, and we've dammed the lake, what are we going to do to fix it? How are we going to fix it? And we began to look at, particularly right away, restoring some of the Kissimmee River. Remember how I said we channelized it right up in the 1960s, early 70s? Here's an example of about 22-mile restoration effort that's been going on. You can see in the middle there where we filled in that channel and reconnected the oxbows. So where we've done this, we now have the return of birds and wildlife, the alligators, and the sandbars along the oxbows, and they're doing their thing to clean that water. And along with that floodplain, they're restoring the, the hydro period that used to be up there to help attenuate those flows. But it's only a small part of the whole Kissimmee, so we need to do more of that. What's also been going on is, is this uh, kind of protection of what happened south of the lake. Remember when we cut that river of grass off, you imagine that land south of the lake in, in the yellow area here called the Everglades Agricultural Area became a prime uh, place to grow crops, and particularly sugarcane. In 1930, the U.S. Sugar Corporation formed and began growing about 200,000 acres on the south rim of the lake. And then in the 1950s or so, the Von Yule family moved up from Cuba and began growing about another 200,000 acres under Florida crystals. And then there's a smaller cooperative for about 480,000 acres out of that total 700,000 acre Everglades Ag Area. Well, what all that was doing was began to flow south, continue to flow and drain south, because they want to keep that land drained for their crops, particularly about 28 to 32 inches below the roots. So they keep it very drained, and they, all that water going south into the Everglades Protection Area and Everglades National Park were causing high levels of pollution particularly phosphorus. We hear of nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen. Phosphorus is a higher pollution uh, consideration for freshwater systems like the Everglades. So in the normal Everglades, it might be around 10 or 12 parts per billion, but all this phosphorus coming out of the EAA, Everglades Ag Area, was about three to 400 parts per billion. So the state was basically brought to task by the federal government through the National Park in 1988 and was settled in 1994 with the Everglades Forever Act and we spent about 1.8 billion to build those uh, orange areas you see there called stormwater treatment areas and they're man-made marshes about one foot or two foot deep with plants in them that uptake the nutrients like phosphorus and they allow that water to be treated basically before it goes south and so that's what happened to one of the restoration and then along came in 1990s, in the mid-90s, the Congress uh, authorized the Corps and said, look, you've got to really look at restoring some of the complete natural systems. So they authorized a restudy of the Central and South Florida Flood Control Project, and it became known as the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. And so this plan was authorized back in the Water Resource Development Act of 2000. 
um, but it was costed out at about $7.8 billion, and there are about 68 components or 68 individual projects as a part of this comprehensive Everglades plan. And a lot of them, the projects had to do with attenuating these flows out of Lake Okeechobee, the estuaries. One of them dealt particularly with uh, aquifer storage and recovery. Now, aquifer storage and recovery is a system of pumping down the excess water into a, the aquifer below the ground and then recovering it or pumping it back when they need it. And on the right-hand side, you see it pumping that water out of Lake Okeechobee and putting it down into what we call the upper Floridan aquifer, and then recovering it or pumping it back out was the system designed to help with the, attenuate the flows out of the, the lake to the estuaries. We also use the uh, Floridan aquifer for our drinking water. You can see down in the center part, when we now we have a, our drinking water, we pump up from the upper Floridan aquifer, treat it in a water plant with reverse osmosis, and then we use that for potable. Years ago, on the left-hand side, we used to use primarily the shallow water aquifer, which is the first two to 300 feet below the surface, ground surface, and that's recharged only by rainfall. So you can see the 55 inches of rainfall a year that recharge the shallow aquifer. We also, in the center, you can see we pump down into the central uh, treatment plant, wastewater treatment. We pump into the lower Florida in our wastewater. And we have about uh, 200 of these deep well injections throughout South Florida. And it's one of the only states in the country that we do this and about 500 million gallons a day that we pump down into the lower Florida. Well, I wanna stay here, just USGS did a study, US Geological Survey on 42 of these wells to determine how much, if there was migration from the lower Florida to the upper Florida. They put dyes down in these 42 wells and they monitored the the upper Floridan wells, and they thought, well, in a week or a couple of weeks, we'll start to see results. Well, within two and a half to three hours, they started to get red dye results up in the upper Floridan aquifer. In fact, a, the story goes that a bread company down in lower east coast in Miami area started making pink bread out of that. So there was there, there's really those squiggly lines I've depicted on there are the transmissivity or the migration in between the upper and lower Floridan. Now, the Floridan aquifer is saltier. It has a little bit higher chloride concentration. So the idea for aquifer storage, was well, you put it down, it forms this big freshwater bubble, stays right there, and then you pump it out. Well, it's not as defined as these confining layers. In fact, it's all cracks and crevices and lime, limestone, so it, it really moves around and it won't stay there. So the, the whole thing of aquifer storage and recovery has really been a plan that's on the books, but it's not really considered uh, viable by a lot of geologists like Dr. Hal Wanless in Miami and others. In fact, Brian LaPointe, who's a, a scientist here, has done a lot of studies in the lower Florida and injection uh, wells migrating out actually east out to the nearshore reefs. And I dove with Brian on the reef south in Palm Beach County. We found the nitrogen signatures creating codium algae blooms and other things, which is just really crazy. So we've got to be very careful. The whole point of this is be very careful what we do in the aquifer system. They also, before the, the federal government got started on that comprehensive Everglades restoration plan, all those 68 components, the deal is that it's supposed to be a 50-50 partnership. So for construction of all that, we're supposed to have 50% federal share through the Corps of Engineers and 50% through the state. Well, the state didn't wait around, and by between year 2000 and 2008, we spent about $2.1 billion in starting some of these accelerate projects or these projects to get going. But there was no real project in the Everglades agricultural area for that storage or that connection between Lake Okeechobee and the Everglades. And until 2008, when there was a, an interest by U.S. Sugar Corporation to divest or get rid of all their 180,000 acres, and this then Governor Charles Chris made a a, a negotiation with them and said, hey, we'd like to buy some of that land and exchange it back so we can get this missing link connection. In fact, we look at this area corridor between Miami and North New River Canal, between Lake Okeechobee and the Everglades, and the pinkish area, reddish color is U.S. sugar lands. Uh, Florida Crystal has some land in there, and then we own a lot of the southern portion, uh, what you see in green there in the EAA is owned by the public. But unfortunately, uh, between 2008 when they started that information and we started doing the reviving the river of grass studies by 2010 when we finally got to purchase there were only two 
uh, parcels purchased, the upper in the upper corner there and the, and the lower left. And that's about a total of about 27,000 acres. But we did purchase the 10-year option to get the rest of it. And their three-year exclusive option just uh, expired in October this year. But uh, another plan came along called the Central Everglades Planning Project, which you might hear from the Corps of Engineers. This takes in about six of those components. And it looks at, at trying to make a connection, not just from the lake to the south, but also all the way south. And if you look up at the top of this on the graphic on the left, you can see that's Lake Okeechobee at the very top. They would convey more water down the Miami North New River to what's called the A1 and A2, which are now flow equalization basins. They're shallow or about four feet deep. They store the water there temporarily, treat it in the stormwater treatment areas, and fill in or backfill part of Miami Canal, that black line there. That would allow more sheet flow across there. Whenever they dug these canals through the Everglades, imagine they dredged them and put the spoil up on one side, so it created a big dam or a levee, so the sheet flow couldn't occur from the upper uh, water conservation area one all the way down to the to Everglades. So they would also degrade the L67, those green lines, and that blue line at the very bottom is Tamiami Trail. And if we were all around here 1928 or 29, I guess, when Tamiami Trail was built, it was a good thing. You're going to connect Miami over to Naples, and everybody can get across the Everglades. But when they built it up on a road, they didn't realize they were creating a, more or less a dam of that water flow that used to flow all the way south. So there's, there's also a goal to e elevate that. In fact, we built a one-mile bridge starting in, uh, which was uh, completed in this March of this year. The other water quality issue had to be addressed too because all those stormwater treatment areas we built weren't treating it to that 10 parts per billion standard that the state had set. So the EPA was requiring the state to get it uh, fixed. In fact, the court mandate came out in a lawsuit. And so the state had to add to some of those uh, restoration sites, those stormwater treatment areas, and we're engaged right now in this kind of restoration strategies for about another 880 million to complete this uh, uh, project for more water quality treatment before the water goes south. And unfortunately, the inequity, and I won't go into detail about it, but we're gonna spend about this 880 million, and it's all gonna come out of th three parts of the pie there, and it's all state money. And not much of that is this agricultural privilege tax, which the Everglades agricultural area pays in order to pay for that pollution uh, process, only about 11 million a year, so it's not very much. I want to focus real quick and before I end on the uh, our basin, and it's not all from Lake Okeechobee. Um, what you see in the colored area is about 514,000 acres of the St. Lucie Estuary Basin. And so we have the C44 Basin around the C44 Canal, C23 and 24 basins, and they all drain into those canals and systems and over to the estuary. So not all of our influence, but the biggest part does come from the lake but it also comes from all these sub-basins and drainage basins into, um, into the estuary. For example, here's the C44 Canal, the line right down the middle. There are about 31 of these sub-basins that enter into it. Now, imagine they're all citrus groves around there, and back then when the canal was built, they said, hey, we could drain our land right here into the canal. That's a natural thing to do, and allow it to go out to the estuary. They had no idea what all that influence would do to discharges out the basin. But it does influence and it contributes a, a lot of not only the, the amount of acre feet of water, but also in metric tons of, of both uh, the uh, phosphorus and the nitrogen. But the big number to look at is the one I circled here, which is over 1,000 metric tons a year on an average year of, of discharges from Lake Okeechobee. Now, this event alone has discharged about 136 billion gallons, uh, which remember that 1.3 billion a day that I mentioned we consume. Well, just this event from May through October is discharged just from the lake, 136 billion gallons. It's over 1.3 million uh, pounds of nitrogen, and it's also about 143,000 pounds of phosphorus and 15 million pounds of that suspended silt and sediment just from this one event this year. And that's five times the standard that's been set by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection called the total maximum daily load. And that's what the, this, this whole total maximum daily load is a process set up by our state to address each of these watersheds. 
and they just adopted this one in, in this year, in June, and it's to set the standard of all these entities in this watershed and how much they're going to reduce both their nitrogen and their phosphorus levels. But the important part is at the bottom that it takes over 15 year implementation process. So even though there's a reduction, they've got 15 years, so 30, about 30% 30 each of those five year segments to reduce it. And in the first phase, uh, what's interesting here is that for nitrogen and phosphorus in that graph, that the agriculture interests who are at the top of the very most highest producers on, in our watershed got a, a phase, they've got a reduction for 90% target enrollment and also for credits for the land use changes from agriculture to other land use. So they actually have a credit going forward, so they don't have to do anything for the first five years, unfortunately. So also in our area are two components of that 68 original, and those included in this what we call the Indian River Lagoon South Plan, and you might hear of that. And that's building a C44 reservoir in stormwater treatment areas and the C23 reservoir in stormwater treatment. And at the very top, um, if I can, way up there, you see the C25? So here's, here's uh, again, this is C23, C24 goes down like this, and C25 is connected way up here, comes out at 10 Mile Creek. And so the C25 is scheduled to have a reservoir, an STA, C24, and here's 10 Mile Creek right here that was a project that was one of the first projects to start but hasn't been functional because it got filled up and it started to leak around it, so they've had to go to lawsuits and all that to do it. But we've got a lot to do in our own watershed to, to fix things, and it's, but it does come from primarily the lake. So this is a summary of the projects that are underway, the current projects, and there are 16 of them, but these first group here are what they call the foundation projects. They're not part of the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. Again, the Kissimmee River, uh, C-111, the modified water, they're trying to repair or rehab the Hoover Dyke. It's an earthen dike, and they're trying to put a head wall down the middle because if it gets too high, there are about 90 locations where there's seepage through the dike, and they're very concerned it would break, like in Katrina over in New Orleans. The state strategies for water quality and lifting the Tamiami Trail, you heard the governor you know, commit another 90 million for 30 million a year for three years to help match the U.S. Department of Interior's 90, so we have the next steps to raise another 2.6 miles of Tamiami Trail. But those, again, are not connected with the Comprehensive Everglades Plan. The next group is the IRL South Plan I mentioned, Site 1, and Picky and Strand, which is over here on the West Coast. And then there's, there's these projects that are in line to be in the next word of bill the Water Resource uh, Reform and Development Act of 2013. This word of bill has passed through the Senate and through the House, but they don't agree, and so they're coming back to conference now before they get passed. But in there, there are four projects here and then six components for that Central Everglades plan. Just remember two processes here. The Corps has to go through feasibility studies and analysis to get these projects authorized through a Water Resource Development Act. That's the authorization. And then they, once they're authorized, now they have to go back to Congress and get them appropriated for funding. So they have, to, they have that two-phase process. So the ones initially, these are already authorized, but they're waiting their next contract for funding. These are not authorized, and they're waiting for their authorization before they can go to the appropriation. What does this mean to the economy? I mean, we actually did studies at the Everglades Coalition and others to find out that doing restoration work, like building these reservoirs, STAs, helping to restore these systems, actually employs people. It actually puts people to work, and actually you get jobs created. In fact, the Everglades Foundation did studies and find if we do invest that $11.5 billion, the return is about f four times that, about $46 billion. And it creates lots of jobs over, over a long period of time, but it does benefit the economy. I want to end here with, too, a, an idea that, was, that we keep bringing back to advocate, and that is to restore a plan that was called Plan 6 uh, back in the 93-94, and that's to stop these estuary discharges and restore the river of grass. And back in 93-94, the recon study and the science uh, subgroup proposed this uh, flowway or this plan six, which would connect Lake Okeechobee between Miami North and River Canal south to the Everglades through some sort of flowway or flow pattern south. 
and that's to provide more water. But this plan six was put aside and those other 68 components, including the ASR wells, were put up. And that's what I show here, that all these other 68 components were put into place. But we really believe that we need to stop the flow going east and west and put it south into some sort of plan that would get it south. And technically, we feel that this is feasible. A lot of people do, but we need to get the political will to make it happen. Obviously, it makes a lot more sense to get the water going south and restore the Everglades flows and stop these damaging discharges east and west. As I mentioned, we already own about 76,000 acres in the south of this 130,000 corridor, and then the other sugarcane farmlands are about another 50,000 there. So we're not talking we need to buy all of the EAA. We need to buy a corridor to get this flowway done. And that's this is kind of what it looks like in that uh, in that area there. We already own all this south of the land. And as I mentioned, the, the aquifer storage and recovery wells, the Lake Okeechobee project it calls for 200 of these 5 million gallon a day wells on the north side of the lake, pumping out of the lake, down into that aquifer, and storing it there. It would take you 152 days to lower the lake by one foot. So it's not very effective. That's pumping 24 seven. That's a lot of electricity you're using to try to lower this lake. And, and compare the capacity, the maximum capacity at 1,500 cubic feet per second compared to 7,300 and 9,300. That's over 16,000 cubic feet per second compared to the 1,500. So obviously there's not enough capacity there to move it out in aquifer storage and recovery. So we need some sort of connection south. The other thing to note on this graph is that these canals south, the total capacity is about 3,800 cubic feet per second. So there's really not existing any um, enough capacity to go south. And look at this, the Everglades is only getting about 13% of the water out of the lake. Uh, we're getting about 20% on this side, they get 44% on Clusatchee, and agriculture uses about 23%. So we want to restore more flow to the, the Everglades so they get more than 13% and we want to stop those discharges. And we've gone through this planning process. And so really the four things I want to leave you with on Everglades restoration are these. One is we got to stop the damaging destructive discharges to these northern estuaries. We now know how valuable they are in the biodiversity, the habitats, the things that we all value. We've moved here for the Indian River Lagoon, the St. Lucie Estuary and Clusatchee. We need to restore the Kissimmee River, number two there. We need to reconnect those oxbows and restore that floodplain so it attenuates the flows before it gets there. We need to manage the, uh, the lake like a lake, not like a reservoir. We need to manage it between about 12 and a half and 15 and a half. This is good elevations for the littoral zones like the, the habit, bass habitat, freshwater fish habitat in the lake. And then finally, we need to enforce treating the water pollution problem at the source of the problem. I'd much rather go upstream and find the farmers or urban runoff or wherever it is and fix it there, help to store it and treat it before it comes off of the farm, than have to do it downstream in some sort of big reservoir or stormwater treatment area. So what about our future? You know, what can we do? How can we help? And i just end with our Florida Oceanographic Society. We were established in 1964. Our mission is thus to inspire environmental stewardship. We have a coastal center on Hutchinson Island. If you haven't been there, we're literally right down the island, uh, right across from the Stewart Beach. We have a large game fish lagoon, which we have sea turtles and sharks and other animals. We do a lot of educational program, hands-on learning, and also research conservation efforts. We do the water quality testing and monitoring. And we restore what you see in orange or red here are all the uh, oyster reefs back in the 1940s. And I've got kind of a little messed up here, but. We had about 470 acres back in the 1940s, and two other surveys reduced down to two, 260 and then 116 in 2003. And in 2005, we had almost a complete die-off, just like we did now. And we fortunately have in our hatchery, uh, shellfish hatchery, we have oysters and clams. We have about 60 of the brood stock of the native oysters. So literally after this event's over, we can spawn those oysters back and, and reseed them. And we've done, we've done some of this back in 05. We take the brood stock, we spawn them, we set them on actual individuals, and we put the seed under people's docks. And after three or four months, they get to about half dollar size. And this is very effective called oyster gardening up in Chesapeake and Carolinas. 
So we copied that process and it's been pretty effective, but it's fairly slow. So now what we do is we collect shell from restaurants and local restaurants in the area and we season the shell and we bag it up into these units with volunteers deploy it. And then we seed that with the eyed larvae stage of these uh, oysters at millions at a time. So we're ready to produce those. And remember two things that oysters do besides maybe they're good to eat are is that there's also about filtration about 50 gallons a day per oyster. Now you put an acre of about 600,000, that's 30 million gallons a day of filtration. And if you had a couple of hundred acres, that's a lot of filtering of water and it really cleans it up. But plus they provide habitat for over 300 different species of little crabs and shrimp and fish that call that reef, that oyster reef, their home in those shallow estuaries. So they're very important. I advocate a lot of things, uh, as Dennis mentioned, and do a lot of work on that. And if you want to learn more about us, go to our website. It's really easy. Everybody goes to websites nowadays, floridaocean.org. And there's some uh, a little brochure, a rack card out on the table for you for later on. So thanks for having me down, uh, Dennis. And, uh, <laughs>